All right, happy Friday, everyone. Let's get started. Um, let's see. So uh, today, uh, I'd like to. So we, we started 14 to 1 last time. We did a little bit of actual calculus. We're going to do more actual calculus today. So um, 14 to 1 is interpreting uh, partial derivatives, and then 14 to 2 is, will be a trip down memory lane, chain rule, product rule, all that sort of stuff. Um, so we'll do a bunch of stuff with 14.1 and 14.2 um, today. I will be available for homework help 4.30 to 5.30 down in the ES classroom. I might be there a little bit earlier, depending on how long things take as they scan my calf, which I think is fine, but they want to scan anyway, um, uh, over at the, at the hospital. So let's see. I think I'll be able to maneuver pretty well. I've learned like this funny sort of crab walk that you'll get <laughs> that I've sort of perfected. Um, so I think, I think uh, that won't be a problem. And my left foot is swollen just a tiny bit, but it's annoying to have a shoe on it. And it's also annoying to only wear one shoe, so that's why I'm not wearing any shoes. <laughs> just, you know, to, and just in case you're wondering. Um, and I've moved my five oh. hours from 4.30 to 5.30 to 6.30 to 7.30, so that doesn't overlap. Yep, great. Yes. Yep. Yep, and, and, and just in case I have uh, as a reminder, right? so I'll be down in the ES classroom, not up in um, the dining hall like I normally am. And that's the, I don't know if you guys are thinking of coming by, but that's the first large classroom on the right in the in turrets, which is like the castle. So again, we don't really do signs here, just to keep you guys on your toes. Um, all right, so I don't have a ton to say to get us started. Um, what I want to do is a bunch of exercises, you know, have you guys do a bunch of exercises today to get you thinking about the partial derivative. And that we've sort of been foreshadowing that pretty strongly all class long, so you've probably had that in the back of your mind. Um, so a bunch of exercises, a few of which I think will sort of be like almost too simple, but not too simple is my, my hope, kind of like we did in the, on the first day of class. Um, and I should mention, those of you who have had other classes for me have probably heard me say this before, but you know, I tend to think that like, there's a, um, like watching other people do math on the blackboard at times can be entertaining or reassuring, but actually is not really a good way to learn math. It would sort of be like learning, trying to learn clarinet by listening to somebody play clarinet. This could be kind of fun and maybe inspirational at best, but you don't really learn that much about clarinet playing by listening to clarinet. So anyway, so that's one of the reasons why I try to like not talk so much. Um, it's also interesting, you know, because then I like process the videos, which is pretty quick, but I can see like the video length is like the amount of time I spent talking. So that can be kind of a good thing, a good way to test like, uh-oh, I, I, wow, I talked too much last class. So anyway, um, th I'm hoping this is a day where I, at least there won't, there, I have no long monologues planned, but probably lots of little will do, you know, you'll be working on problems and you'll have questions. I can move around, Ian can move around if, if they're just, you know, quick questions, but probably lots of just like kind of quick checking in on the board as we plow through some stuff. So that's my guess for today. Uh, questions? All right, so let's start messing around with derivatives. So I would just say start with problem one, and then we'll do problem two, and then we'll do problem three, and we'll feel better about derivatives at the end. And I am going to uh, look for some assistance taking these up the stairs. Okay. All right, so um, let me. Maybe we should talk through these things and uh, start with number two, because number one segue is more natural than number three, which at this point makes me wonder why I didn't assign number two, one, and one, two. But anyway, here we are. So um, Beatles. Um, and apparently, this is, this is based on a true story. Apparently, that is a way of, um, rend like if you have some piece of roadkill or other kill and you want to get the skeleton out of it, you like let beetles eat it. Um, I think I learned this from students apparent, uh, sometime when I was teaching Calc 3 and was sufficiently horrified to hear, learn about that, that I had to turn it into a calculus problem. It's a, it's a good way to work through stuff. <laughs> is the behind yeah, yeah, is it like, the, like a bug house or something? Yeah, they call it. I mean, it, it's kind of horrifying, but it's also kind of cool. So you know, it, I think, I mean, it's hard. I think it's cool, like as long as I'm like 
10 plus meters away from that. <laughs> I think if I got within a 10 meter radius, I'll have a very different feeling about it. But I don't, I don't do so well with bugs. So, um, yeah. so, um, <laughs> so what's the meaning of M3 comma 2 equals 28? Um, and then, like, what about M02? Just in practical terms, what does that tell you? Yep. Yeah. yeah, so that's before the Beatles get at it, right? And so. Yeah, they, have, they just haven't started eating yet. You know, like, I, d uh, I really. <laughs> this image is getting worse. But, you know, you've got, like, your, your, you've got your two kilogram, I don't know how you transport Beatles, and it's, like, right before you, like, set the Beatles free. Right. Yeah, exactly. You're like, all right, guys, you can do this. Did you find No, I came up with it. Yeah, this is all my own. <laughs> yeah. um, but there are there's similar problems in the, in, in the book. They're just not quite as graphic. Um, so so for, for C, would you expect M03 to equal M02? Yeah, because that's the idea is like, it's the same deer. Nobody started to eat it yet. Um, so. Uh, Partial M partial T, um, how would you, what, is that, what does that tell you? Yep, and what, and what would the units be? Yep, so you, you can, I mean, derivatives are just ratios. And so the units on top over the units on bottom give you the units of the derivative. So that can sometimes be useful for interpreting a derivative. Um, so this would be, yeah, uh, loss in uh, or change in mass per time. What about partial m partial b? That's a little harder to think about. Uh, sorry, say it again. The it's unitless, right? So it would be kilograms per kilogram, uh, which becomes unitless. In practical terms, what does that tell you? Yeah, um, and so maybe it's easy. It might be easier to think of in terms of a number. So like if we jump down to F, MB32 equals minus 1.8. Go, go for it. Wouldn't it not be unitless because it would be kilograms of the carcass over kilograms of beetles? Which then they cancel them. Yeah. Let's see. Well, they're measuring, yeah, measuring different things. Yeah. Yeah, but but suppose yeah, suppose bug maybe like bug maybe the bug supply company measures their bugs in ounces. So it would it would certainly be. Oh, let's see. You can. I mean, so the ratio would be dimensionless in terms of physics. But like, if you were if it was in ounces, then you would get a different number. So. Yeah. Well, I mean, I feel like it has to be unitless because what does it mean to have kilograms over kilograms? Like that doesn't mean anything, you know. Like, okay. If you had kilograms per hour, that means yeah, something. But like kilograms over kilograms just means something. It's just, it's yeah, just exactly. like, the ratio. Yeah. yeah. So all right. So so <laughs> putting aside the unit question for just one second. So so f just to be clear, what that would mean? That would mean that at time three. And if there were two kilograms of beetles, there would be 1.8 kilograms less of deer if there were one more kilogram of beetles. So it tells you how much less, how the mass changes as you increase the amount of beetles at a given amount of time. So if you imagine two experiments, you have the identical deer, and in one case you put three kilograms of beetles in there, and the other you put two kilograms of beetles, and you wait three days, this tells you that the difference between the masses of the two carcasses Carci, carcasses, um, would be 1.8. Um, so the numerical answers you you get would be different if if you if you did if you measured beetles in ounces instead of kilograms. So I don't know. So I so I feel like the dimensions are it's definitely some sort of dimensionless number because it's a mass over a mass. 
the actual number you would get would depend on the um, units you used. And if you used ounces and ounces, that might also might be a different number. So I feel like, let's call it a dimensionless, but not exactly unitless number. So if, um, if, so a couple ways to think about it. If we had two deer, identical deer, and in one of them we gave two kilograms of beetles to, and the other we gave three kilograms of beetles, after three days, those deer carci will have different masses, and the one that had three beetles eating it would have a mass 1.8 less than the one that had two kilograms of beetles eating it. Um, so I, as long as the story is clear, I, I, that's, I think we're in good shape. And then um, M uh, sub T, 3, 2, that tells us that if there are two kilograms of beetles after three days, the deer is losing mass at a rate of a half a kilogram per day. So things that are a rate, something for time is a little more natural to think of as a rate of change. The um, M with a B is, is a little you know, sort of funnier to think about. Uh, questions about the beetles, or shall we? Okay. Think about the kilograms per kilogram question in terms of like population or density, and then the unit becomes like you cannot have a density without units. But usually. Well, mm, 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 probably, yeah, so like if you're talking about like how many, like, like, how, like, like constant, like a, well, because it depends on the density. If you're, if you're talking about like how many elephants are there per square kilometer, there are units, elephants in square kilometers. If you're talking about the, the concentration of salt in water or something, then that doesn't necessarily have units with it. So maybe it's, maybe one can think of this as a concentration. I don't know. This is a weird enough example that I don't quite know exactly what physics problem to map it or chemistry problem to map it to. Yeah. It seems like another way that you could express this is a, like number of beetles, just n per kilogram of deer. Sorry, rather the other way around. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that would convey the same kind of information that saying kilograms of beetles would yep. have, but would carry units. So it seems like it still makes. It seems like you're kind of tossing out information to say that this is a unitless. Yeah, is I, there a way with units to express it that convey the same, same information, information? Yeah, and it may be that I mean I've never bought beetles. It may be like so I don't know. Do you buy beetles by the kilogram or by the thousand? I, you know I, I don't know. Well, yeah. <laughs> I definitely agree. It doesn't have dimensions. But, but I think you, so it's a dimensionless quantity that would have a different numerical value depending on your choice of units. <laughs> anyway, I, we're, we're, getting, we're getting farther and farther away from math. Um, so let's, let's leave the Beatles. I mean, I think the main point is to, is to sort of think through what these different derivatives mean, which I feel like we've done plenty of. Um, so let's, let's go back now to, to number one. And so estimating the following quantities, these are my versions with corrections. And so you, know, you do this, you look at the table of numbers, and you find the point x, y. So x is, say for the second one, x is 1, and y is negative 1. And then you're asking for, the, for fx, uh, partial derivative of f with respect to x. How does the function change if you move in the x direction? And so you figure out what the x direction is on the graph, and things are labeled, the things go in slightly annoying directions. And you just read change in f over change in x. And you, you, and you just kind of, in this one, change in x is kind of going up and down this way. And then you look for change in y, and you don't worry about what's going on with x. And then you did the same thing for 1.20.6 once you remembered what that, where the point was. Yeah? Um, for f of y, I'm on 1.2, or you know, that bottom thing. Yeah. Those are not the numbers I pulled, but I got the same rate. 
Did you? I don't know why you did it. So. One point. So I I said. So, so for all of these, you sort of have this choice. You're given a point, and you want to know, like how it's changing. And so you could like take a step forward, or backward. And I think, I think I took a step forward, and maybe you took a step backward, or vice versa, or something like that. Um, yep. Yeah. I have a couple negatives. One point eight is negative, and one point four is negative. For me. I think that's a sign oh, I just problem, or I don't know if it's a sign problem on me. Or no, it's a sign problem on me for this one for sure. Um, and I had it right here. I just I was so stressed out about subtraction. I don't, I'm not, <laughs> I don't feel good about subtraction. Um, this one. Yeah, that that was kind of. What do other folks have for this one? Is, do you guys have negative also? So, so if Um, OK, so these problems, again, the graph was annoying to read, and it's not always clear if you're going up or down. But uh, again, the rate, of the rate of change, I mean, derivatives are rates of change. We know how to calculate rates of change. It's how much something changes divided by how long it changed for. And minus signs are fun, but eventually we, we get that. Um, so over on the left board are some sketches. So f of x and 1, you can. Get that, I and mean, we've kind of done this example before. There are a number of ways to see this. But f of x and 1, that means y is 1. And so then if I look at all the x values for which y is 1, that's just a column of numbers. And then you can sketch that column of numbers. You notice it starts large, goes down. Um, the smallest value in that column would be 1, and then it goes up again. Um, and then similar for. Um, 0 and y, um, you get just a, a row of numbers. So this is what we've seen before, right? that if you just fix one of the variables, you're back to a one-dimensional problem. So then um, if we sketched this um, thing, what is, what is this derivative going to look like? Linear line, and let's see, it's, I think it's going to, because it's decreasing here, increasing there, and the slope is 0 there. Um, it is the, the slope is not constant. I mean, it is a parabola, but the second derivative would be constant, is I think is what you're thinking. The slope of the slope is constant. Because so technically, yeah. what you're drawing is the slope of, of the graph of all. Mm -hmm. right? Yep. And so, like here, you're going. If you're skiing, you're going downhill very fast, and then you're going downhill not so fast, and then here it's the slope is zero, and then here you're going uphill. Oh yeah, but you have no way of knowing quadratic. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yep. I was thinking it was. But. Yep. And then here it's going to be a. Um, Almost identical picture. So, um, okay. So, and another way to picture this is that the graph of x x one and the graph of zero y are both slices of this paraboloid. And it's this bowl shaped thing, and again, you can imagine just slicing it with a sharp knife or a piece of wire, and then you the edge that you would get would be these shapes. Um, OK, so now let's think about how to do this using algebra. So it turns out that this is a parabola. Oops, f of xy is 
x squared plus y squared. And so when you were finding a derivative, say, in the x direction, you just find where you are in the table of numbers, and then you completely ignore y. Then you're just like, OK, I need to step in the x direction. And who cares what's happening with y? I don't care anymore. I just want to know how to go in the x direction. Um, so, and similarly, what you can th sort of think of things, say this as a function of x, just fix a value of y, and then like, I don't care about y anymore. y is no longer a variable to me. It is a constant to me. And so that tells you how to take these derivatives algebraically. So if I wanted to know, I'm asking the function, how do you change with respect to x? Um, So I'm asking x squared, how do you change with respect to x? And the answer to that question is 2x. And then I'm asking y squared, how do you change with respect to x? It's constant, yeah. So y doesn't change, because it's not changing with respect to x. On the other hand, Or how mobile I am. Um, so, how does x squared change with respect to y? Doesn't, yep. And then, how does y squared change with respect to y? Is this? So, the, the um, algorithm for taking partial derivatives using algebra is to just pretend, I mean, it's not even pretend. Like When you're asking how something changes with respect to one variable, all the other variables are constant as far as that variable is concerned, and, and vice versa. So it can, you know, the, the hardest part is you, you just want to like be sure to slow down in, enough, because you, you know, you're, if you're going a little too quickly, it's easy to think that this should be 2x plus 2y. But so, so always sort of ask yourself, all right, how does, what am I taking the derivative with respect to? What's a variable and what's a constant? And so this would give you the x slope and that would give you the y slope. So take a moment to do number three. I think it'll just be a moment and then we'll do lots more derivatives. So problem three. Um, we now know how to use algebra. This is what I meant by using algebra to calculate the um, partial derivatives. There they are. And then if I want to know the derivative at a point, well, I just plug in my x and y values. Um, and doing so, I get numbers that are pretty similar to those that we got from the um, table of numbers. They're not identical because right, when you do the derivative, we're letting the step size become infinitely small. And here, you, if you just have the table, you're limited to a step size of 0 0.2. That's the smallest you can do. Um, I guess one could get fancy and do a step size forward and backward and average those two to kind of get a little more information from this table of numbers. But anyway, uh, so now you know how to take partial derivatives using algebra. Okay. All right. I just want, I was like waiting for some reaction. All right. So um, what I want to do now, and this will probably take us through the rest of the class, is um, now, is the, now is the point when we get to remember the chain rule and the product rule and, and all that sort of stuff. So um, what I have is um, problems just kind of to zip through. And some of you will remember these right away. And some of you for whom it's been longer may not. That's totally fine. Um, so on the first page is just a bunch of one-dimensional derivatives to um, get your derivative muscles loose and limber so you don't pull or tear anything. And then on the other side is some partial derivatives. So we'll just chug through this. I can answer questions as we go, and we'll see what happens. All right, let me um, say a few things about our old friend, the chain rule. Um, some, some folks still are probably have vivid dreams about the chain rule. I'm looking at, looking at you guys who are, for whom this is more immediate than many folks in the room who've had a couple years since I've done this. Um, so 
let's see. Let me see if I want to say anything about this. This, this one is, um, if you're taking the derivative of an exponential function and the base isn't e, you get kicked out this extra natural log of whatever the base is. Um, and that's probably, when, once you do it a bunch as a rule, you remember, you can always, I mean, you can, you can always look these rules up, too. Um, if you wonder why that is, um, if you write 2 to the x as e to the natural log x, and then take the derivatives um, using the chain rule, which of course is what you all are actually wanting me to talk about, and I will in a second, that's, that's where that rule comes from. Um, so that's a rule that's easy to derive if you forget it and don't feel like looking it up in a book. Um, OK, so chain rules, those apply when we have a function of a function. So you have functions sort of that are chained together. So here we have an inner function. That's the thing that happens first on the inside, and that's squaring, and then an outer function, sine. And so we evaluate from the outside in, pretending the inner function is constant. So the derivative of sine blah is cosine, cosine blah, yep. Uh, so I'm just pretending that blah is constant. But actually, then, then the last step is to take the derivative of blah, the inner part. Derivative of x squared is 2x. So this is 2x cosine x squared. Um, this is the same function. It's just shifted up by 2. And that won't change the slope. Um, derivative of 2 is 0. It's the algebraic way to see that. So this answer is the same. Yeah. Um, OK, so then this one, this is the product rule. And so it's tempting just to take the derivative of this times the derivative of that, but it's a little bit more complicated. We do the derivative of the first one, leave the second one alone, plus leave the first one alone, take the derivative of the second one. Um, and I can still hear sort of the cadence of my high school calculus teacher say, fix this one, do that one, do that one, fix this one. And he's German, so there's a slight German accent, and I can't do German accents. But anyway, I have this. I still hear all these lyrics that I have to fix this one. Anyway, so you might have your own little rhythm or song you sing to yourself. Um, that's between you and yourself, whatever you want to do. But anyway, so um, derivative of x squared is 2x, and then I leave the second one alone. Then I, then I leave the first one alone and take the derivative of the second one. So that's our friend the product rule. And um, maybe I'll, I'll talk about these in a bit, but let me just mention something like this. So this one you could use the quotient rule for. As some of you know, I'm not a big fan of the quotient rule, because it seems like it's just an unnecessary rule. Like, to me, like, the less rules you can have in life, the better. That's like, the whole point of math, is you just figure it out. It's not rules. Um, and so I like thinking of this as sine minus 2. And then I just use the product rule and the chain rule. And those are the, those are the, the good rules, not the quotient <laughs> rule. But um, you know, whatever the high d, high d, low d, low stuff that maybe some of you had to learn, whatever those sort of mnemonics are. OK, some, some of you, yeah, there's like, yeah, I, yeah. See, I don't, I don't like the quotient rule. It's just, just chain and product rule. So anyway, um, if you haven't done these, um, take a moment to do these, and then there's a whole bunch of stuff on the other side, and we'll, we'll start talking through those two in a little bit. All right. Um, so let me, let me go through these and, and answer a few questions that have popped up along the way. Um, so. Um, this is another chain rule problem. And it's the same two functions, but they're in, in opposite order. Right? So this one here was square and then sine. This one is sine and then square. So you, as you're talking to yourself, the outer function now is the inner function and vice versa. Uh, another chain rule. And here is the non-quotient rule problem. If you, if you do the quotient rule, you'll get, you'll get an answer that looks slightly different than this, but it'll be the same because it's math. Um, and different correct methods yield the same thing. Um, OK, so now for the fun parts, partial derivatives. So uh, we take the derivative of this with respect to x. We're asking, how does this change as x changes? The derivative of 2x, sorry, of x squared is 2x. How does this change with x? It doesn't, so that's 0. 
Similar story here leads to minus 4 cosine y. Um, so g, this one can be um, maybe a little trickier. So partial g, partial x, we're asking, how does this change with x? And there can be, in some people, a, a, a real desire, a temptation to do the product rule. Because it sure looks producty. Things are being multiplied. But remember, so far as x is concerned, y is a constant. We're just asking, you know, x, x is just x. It doesn't care about y. So um, this is just the, like, the derivative of 3. So like, the derivative of 3x would be 3. The derivative of 3xy squared is just 3y squared. Um, here we're asking, how does g depend on t? And the answer is, it doesn't. It's not a function of t. So that gives us 0. And here, something I didn't ask but could have, how does g depend on y? Well, then 3x is a constant so far as y is concerned. Um, and so the derivative of y squared is 2y. And this 3x is just a constant that hangs out up front. Um, so you know the mechanics, the chain rule, the product rule is exactly the same. It's no harder or easier. Um, the thing to remember, and I sort of, and this is what I heard people saying as comments filter down here. Um, you know, always remind yourself what's changing. Is this derivative with respect to x or with respect to y? Um, is it respect to t? So so you'll need to kind of constantly be asking what's a variable, what's momentarily constant. Um, this one, we know this is the equation of a plane. It fits that, that formula. And we know that what makes a plane a plane is that its slopes are constant. And so you know, not shockingly, when we take the um, partial x derivative of the plane, we get the x slope. And it doesn't depend on x or y. It's just the number 3. And we take the partial derivative of h with respect to y, and we get the y slope. And it doesn't depend on x or y. It's constant. And thus, if I evaluate this derivative at different points on the plane, um, that's not very exciting. I get the same answer. But it should be reassuring, because you get the same answer. That's what you would expect. Um, so then lastly here, when you have a function that's derivative, you can evaluate the function at a point, and you can evaluate the derivative at a point. So um, if you do this, and you remember how multiplication works, which I momentarily forgot, um, you'll find that the altitude or the value of g here is 54. So you're 54 feet above sea level or whatever. Or there are 54 kilograms of deer left or something. Who knows? Um, and the x slope, if you move in the x direction, would be 27. And we could calculate the y slope, and we could get both of those slopes at the same time if we wanted. Um, so 14.2, we're basically covered. It's, it's the algebra of taking partial derivatives. And it's um, almost disappointing. Yes? OK, okay. <laughs> no problem. 14.1 um, is about how to think about um, these partial derivatives. And I think that's a lot more interesting and fun. So what, what I'll probably do for uh, Tuesday is maybe another sort of interpretation problem. I think it's good to think, think through these. It's helpful to see a lot of these. Maybe, and we'll probably do a few partial derivatives just to practice a little bit more. But these are the things that I think that web, web work is going to be really good for also, so that you can just practice them. Am I remembering this? The computer tells you right away if you are or if you aren't. Um, you probably won't be at first. Darn, you'll ask for help. You'll look it up. Then you'll, then you'll get it. You'll feel happy and, and um, go on your way. So I will be over in the dining hall. It might take me a slightly bit longer to get there than usual, but I'll be there. I can hang out for a little bit if people have questions. Um, is anybody, Ian, do you ha are you able to carry this down? OK, great. So I don't need help with that. I have a question about the web work. Yep. Um, is, there, is there any way we can know a, consist a consistent notation to answer the problem? Because often it will take pi as 3.14, whatever that's what you want to add. It takes it as pi, but sometimes it will take it in the number. Sometimes it will take the radians as a number. Sometimes it yep. will want the fraction. Um, I don't know. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> like a lot of times you get it wrong five times and you realize that you've been entering yeah, the same thing. Yeah. Yep. Okay. But that builds character. <laughs> <laughs> it builds patience. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Where will you be, say, after yeah. like, your calculations? Yeah. Like, 
Chaos and Fractals. So right after Chaos and Fractals, I'll be gone, but I'll be back around 4 or 4.30, and I'll be down in the ES classroom. So, yep.